Hi. So, um, a while back I spoke about my contentions with the term white privilege, and I hope I laid out um, some valid arguments, some strong arguments there as to why I think it's such a problematic and divisive term. Um, and in a similar vein, I think that the concept of male privilege is problematic. Now, before um, people get reactionary, and by that really I mean um, feminist critics, uh, no, I am not saying that women don't have challenges. I'm not saying everything is great for women, and I'm not attempting to shame women either. That's not the idea of this video. Rather, the idea is to counter a narrative that I think is um, far, far too simplistic. And the narrative goes like this, that because historically men have had power, and that is true, um, you know, historically, if we look at the Western world, indeed most of the world, um, it is men that have held positions of power overwhelmingly in government, in monarchy and in in other areas in business. Um, and one of the most commonly cited examples of this power dynamic is voting rights. Um, you know, uh, one way to look at a country's progress is to see the sort of rights that women have in terms of property, in terms of uh, voting uh, franchisement. Um, and it is true that for a long time, women couldn't vote. So they didn't have the means to have an influence in the decision-making processes that were impacting everyone, including half the population. So I totally acknowledge all of that. Um, and it's a historic injustice that was righted when women finally got the vote in uh, 1928 in this country. Um, but on that point, it's important to understand that for a very long time, most men didn't have the vote either. Um, so the path to suffrage actually started off with the path to male suffrage, if we look at the Chartist movement, for example, in Victorian Britain. Um, but anyway, I want to just uh, address this idea that because men have had the power, historically speaking, or rather a select few men have had the power, uh, that somehow equates to male privilege as a general thing, as a general concept. And I think that's a very um, contentious idea. Uh, I'm just going to give some examples to uh, provide a bit of context to my thinking on this. If we take one of the most famous disasters ever, uh, the Titanic, the sinking of the Titanic, I've been looking at statistics, and I was broadly familiar with this, but I thought uh, I wanted to be accurate, I wanted to get the right figures. Um, so I've looked at different sources, and there's some discrepancy you know, different sources give slightly different results, but they are broadly the same figures, and they are as follows. So, if we, well, first of all, before I look into that, before I go into that, let's briefly look at what privilege means. It means getting perks, right? It means it get it means getting something undeserved or getting something that someone else doesn't have in an undeserved way. That's literally what the word means. Privilege. It's an adjective meaning. Um, getting something for nothing, right? That's what it means. Now, if we look at the breakdown of the Titanic, um, the majority of passengers on board, um, both crew and uh, civilian, for want of a better term, uh, were men. Um, so, you know, if you look at film adaptations, you kind of get the idea it's 50-50. Actually, a sizable majority was men. Um, now, if we look at this, if we break it down a bit, uh, passengers, there were 805 male passengers, adult male passengers on board. That's across all three classes, steerage, second class and first class. Now, the breakdown was that um, 146 men survived, 659 men perished. Okay. That's 146, 659. Um, now, of the crew, the overwhelming majority of the crew were men. That was, for example, that included uh, all those those men working in the boiler room, firemen, um, crew members, 
um, sailors, all, all stewards, people like that. Um, and there were 693 crew members who perished, many of them from the city of Southampton, and 192 survived. Some of those were manning boats, uh, and others survived for a variety of reasons. So how does this break down? This breaks down that a total of 338 men, adult men, passengers and crew survived. 1,352 men died on the Titanic. 338 survived, 1,352 died. So a great deal more died than survived. If we look at women, um, the ratio was as follows. Um, there were 200, uh, excuse me, 296 women on the Titanic who survived, 106 who perished. Um, and I believe this can be broken down into, uh, let me just get this right, oh excuse me, that's passengers, 296 female passengers who survived, 106 who perished, 20 female crew members, uh, that would be stewardesses, maids and so on, who um, survived and two or three who perished, uh, meaning a total of 109 adult women uh, perished on the Titanic. So how does this work out in terms of ratios? Because obviously we have to look at this in terms of the total numbers on board. But as a ratio, this works out that of women, adult women, 74% survived. And only 19% of men survived on the Titanic. Now, you might think, why am I looking so deeply into this? Um, it matters. It matters in terms of a famous example of the lack of male privilege. Say that there wasn't male privilege for the vast majority of men who died on the Titanic. And of course, women died as well. There were, um, this was a human tragedy. Um, as for children, uh, a disturbing statistic is almost half the children on the Titanic perished. You know, we're not talking about a small number, half the children. And that isn't broken down into boys and girls, so we, we don't know um, unless you were to look at each individual passenger. Uh, but 56 survived, 53 died, other sources say 56 and 56. Um, so that's interesting. Um, now, I don't want to be misunderstood. Of course, there were poor steerage women who perished, and there were actually four, four first-class women who perished on the Titanic. Um, some famous examples, Isa and Isidore Strauss. Uh, Isa Strauss insisted that she stay with her husband, and the Strausses died very bravely. There's a park to them in New York City. Um, so in no way am I meaning to disparage anyone on that ship. But look at what happened. The prominent men who survived, were they seen as survivors? Were they kind of told, oh, you know, you were very lucky, um, happy you're still alive? No. Prominent men who survived the Titanic were shamed. Um, famous example, Bruce Ismay who I believe has been strongly, strongly vilified by history in a very unfair way. Every film has cast him as the villain. Uh, yet there is zero evidence that Bruce Ismay, the chairman of White Star Line, pushed past women and children or anything of the sort. In fact, there is some indication that he was ordered onto a lifeboat. So why does this matter? It matters because of optics. Um, the Titanic was a human tragedy, and it was a disgrace that anyone died. It was a disgrace that there was a shortage of lifeboats. But the fact that the vast majority of adult men died, and I should say a lot of the crew were teenage boys, so we say adults, but really a lot of them were 15 and 16 year olds. Um, you know, that's striking. And that's just a famous example. I don't want to make this video exist excessively long, so I'll move on and look at some other things. Throughout history, how many millions of men have died um, serving their country in armed conflict. Millions, millions and millions and millions. Not just thinking of the two world wars, going back through millennia. Men have always, always been expected to fight and die for the country. That's always been the case throughout history. And if, although it's highly unlikely, if we were to suffer an invasion today, able-bodied men would be expected to fight. I'm not saying that is right or wrong, 
but it is a fact of history. So this is something that some feminists just ignore. To be fair, early feminists, early suffragettes, uh, there was a schism within the Pankhurst family. I believe it was Sylvia Pankhurst, and apologies if I'm making a mistake on that. I think it was one of the sisters, I think it was Sylvia Pankhurst, was actually a dedicated socialist and a pacifist. And to her credit, she um, campaigned against the war because, precisely because so many young men were dying. And the writer of Vera Britton, who was an early um, suffragist and uh, feminist, um, also protested against the war for the same reason. So I don't mean to say that uh, every feminist is ignorant about male sacrifice. That's not the case. However, you do see, particularly today, a lot of feminists, uh, particularly if they've been indoctrinated by gender studies, really do put out this narrative of male privilege. You're a man, you get perks. But to me, that ignores history. It ignores the fact that throughout history, not only has there been a unique expectation on men, you know, that expectation was never cast on women in pretty much any society. Yes, there have been female warriors in history. There are some examples. But overwhelmingly, it is men who were expected to fight and die for their countries. And they have died and been wounded and shell-shocked and mentally scarred in their millions. Millions. It's no exaggeration. Now, of course, civilians have died in war as well. Women have also suffered, both as casualties of war, uh, when civilian areas have been attacked. And we know of some awful atrocities, of course, um, the Holocaust and various genocides throughout history, the rape of Nanking. So um, women have also suffered. But the expectations of war are uniquely put on men to serve the country. That's irrefutable. Um, I suppose you could say that women, particularly in the world wars, were expected to be nurses and serve in that sense. But I would suggest that fighting and dying for one's country is something uniquely put on young men. Um, able-bodied men, at least. Uh, now, again, uh, before I'm misunderstood, I'm not saying that, oh, men went off and died and were blown up and women had a life of luxury. No, um, my grandmother, my late grandmother, worked in a munitions factory. That was difficult, hard work, and it was dangerous as well. There were several examples of munitions disasters where young women were killed. In the First World War, for example, um, just one example, the um, chilling, I think it was called the Chillingham Colliery outside Nottingham, a uh, shell uh, munitions factory. There was an explosion and 118 workers were killed, many of them young women. A similar disaster happened at Crossley in Leeds, Crossgate, excuse me, and there were several others. Um, and, you know, throughout history, I honestly think it's more of a class issue than a gender issue because you know there was no fun for um a woman working in a Victorian mill or um in other manual labor jobs um but there was no fun for men either and at one point women girls were even sent down mines but that was cut out I believe in the 1840s or 1860s and then uh later young boys were prohibited from going down mines but if we look at labour history, you can find examples of dark, dirty, difficult and dangerous work by both men and women. But when it comes to war, I do believe that um, it's fair to say that there is unique expectations on men in terms of fighting and dying. Uh, I would say some masculine groups, they show this. Uh, I've seen a picture, for example, showing um, men dying on front lines whilst... I have this picture of like Victorian ladies with parasol sort of lounging in the sun. It's not quite that simple. There were a lot of working class Victorian women who had miserable lives. Um, so we should be careful about, you know, making things black and white. And I certainly don't make it black and white that women have always had luxury very, very far from it. And the fact that they didn't have voting rights added insult to injury. However, what I do insist on is the concept of male privilege. It isn't just about war. Uh, you know, a young man in this region, a hundred years ago, um, 120 years ago, 
his choice in life, basically to go to the shipyard, to go down a pit, and at wartime, go to the front. That was his choice in life. That's what he could expect from life. All three were dangerous, particularly mining and obviously being in the front line. Uh, coal mining was a dark, dangerous job. And thousands of men and boys were killed and maimed doing that work. Um, if we look today, even today, um, if you look at the most dangerous occupations, fortunately speaking, in terms of accident to work, many of them, I'm talking about developed countries here, um, are occupied by men, like oil rig workers, for example, um, road maintenance, those sort of things, uh, which have a high accident rate, are um, proportionally more occupied by men. Now, to be fair, women might say, feminists might say, well, about the military thing, what about women who want to join? What about women who want to serve? And of course, in recent years, women have served in the armed forces, and some of them have died. Um, you know, and they're heroes. They've died for their country, and their sacrifice should be remembered. But um, I don't think that's enough of a a way to counter the fact that throughout history there's been a unique expectation put on men. Now, feminists might say, "Well, it's the fault of the patriarchy," and it is true that the a lot of those expectations, for example, um, about men joining up, uh, was a sort of patriarchy-led thing. You could argue, for example, the war office in the First World War in act actively said to women it was their patriotic duty to shame men. So it was this very ugly thing whereby it was this nationalistic hysteria in every country, uh, the notorious White Feather campaign, when uh, young women were told it was their patriotic duty to shame men. Um, incidentally, Emmeline Pankhurst was an enthusiastic supporter of that. Now, you could argue that campaign directly led to many men being killed because they were literally shamed to the front. Um, and it's awful. These were days, of course, when uh, mental health, post-traumatic stress and so on was barely understood. Um, but I just wish that feminists would acknowledge that a bit more when they talk about male privilege. And OK, they can blame the patriarchy, it's simply a contradiction say that men have all the rights and all the privileges when there has been a unique expectation on men, not just at times of war, but also in disasters. If we look at the Titanic, the principle of women and children first, it actually stemmed from the 1860s. What happened was there was a disaster in the Bay of Liverpool. I think it was 1863, I can't remember the precise year, uh, a liner called the HMS Birkenhead. And what happened was there wasn't actually a codified rule saying there had to be women and children first, but uh, the ship ran into trouble and there were wives and children of some of the sailors on board. And it's a kind of code of chivalry, if you like, or uh, Victorian values, I suppose. I, I, You could look at it in a range of different ways. They insisted that the women and children get off. So that's where the idea of women and children first is thought to um relate to now just for the record so that people don't misunderstand me um i would without a shadow of a doubt um be prepared to die for the woman i love uh you know if i was on a sinking ship and there wasn't enough lifeboats and i had a wife or a girlfriend with me absolutely i would insist that she get on so I don't want to be a hypocrite. I guess I have a somewhat old-fashioned mindset in that sense. You know, and I do think, in my opinion, as a man, I do think that uh, you should protect the woman uh, you love. I do think it's, it's, it's part of being a man to look out for those who are more vulnerable than yourself. So I do actually believe in the principle of it. But I do also resent the fact that male sacrifice sometimes gets ignored with this narrative of um, male privilege. It's a, it's a totally obnoxious term. Because the reality is, throughout history, there were a small group of privileged men in the upper classes who had all the power, and the rest of people, women and men, didn't have the power. That's the reality of it. It was more a class issue than a gender issue. 
Um, but even looking at the upper class, there were a lot of very wealthy men who died on the Titanic, as an example. And, you know, they could have easily got into lifeboats, technically speaking. Um, they could have bribed their way on. They could have. But they didn't. If you look at Google, Benjamin Guggenheim, John Jacob Master, these were men who were incredibly wealthy. Um, is a Strauss, uh, but they died. Um, partly because there were too few lifeboats, but also because of the roads. But I also think they felt it was a matter of honour. Um, so that can't be overlooked. And it does bug me a bit when, you know, this narrative is put out there. It's the same with, you know, the so-called privileged white people line. Um, Roger Daltrey of The Who um, has said that he believes the British white working class is now the, at the bottom of rungs of society. And he, I think he might have a point. He said when he joined the band in the 60s, they were looking at American blues music and soul music, which kind of gave a voice to the voices, the underclass, which at that time was African-American. Um, he believes that today's underclass in Britain is the white working class. Um, I'm always a little bit wary about playing identity politics, regardless of background, but I don't think he's entirely wrong in that. I mean, as an example, and I don't want to go off subject here, but look at the abuse scandal of grooming gangs in the north of England. The majority of victims were young white working class girls, but they were mostly white, and that really, really didn't get the sort of coverage it should have got given the scale of the abuse. The BBC ignored it. Now, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but, you know, where's the white privilege there? So that's why I will fight forcefully against this concept of privilege. I think it's a very, very obnoxious term to just talk about white male privilege, because those are the two demographics so-called progressives always target, white male privilege. Um, this is not to say there aren't white male, there aren't privileged white males. There are. You know, if you're Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, you're going to have a pretty comfortable life. But what I really strongly resent about the concept is its ignorance of history and its generalizing nature. So, dear feminists, stop talking about privileged men whilst ignoring historic facts. 